Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Pound for Pound Boxing Report, uh, episode 303. I am your host, Michael. Joining me uh, this week, uh, Gail, from, Gail from Communities Digital News, uh, Daniel from the Subscriber, and uh, a regular uh, fan and follower of the show, um, Unrivaled Boxing News. Boxing News. Uh, what's going on, ladies and gents? Very glad to have Unrivaled joining us officially this week. Thanks. And thanks, guys. Always a pleasure to jump on. Thanks for having me on. I'm doing well, and, Michael. And it looks like Daniel had to jump off. I hope we can get him, get him back on. Um, for those who are new to Pound for Pound Box Report, Pound for Pound Box Report, live YouTube show, uh, podcast, as well as blog, discussing all things boxing. The motto is when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When it's bad, we will talk about it. Bottom line is, if it concerns the sweet science, we will talk about it. For the time being, the best place to go to to find where you could to Best place to go to to find out all information regarding the show is the blog page, p4pboxerreport.wordpress.com. That's the link. Uh, you check the right, top right of the blog page, or if you're checking us out on YouTube, either live or later on um, in the description, you'll find links to where to follow us all over social media, uh, where to find us all over um, RSS feed, distributed podcast platforms like Spotify and iTunes and Google Podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, where you can donate, we do have a Cash Me and PayPal donation link. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, my link to my online fitness uh, coaching page. I am an online coach from Beachbody.com. Uh, if you check out Beachbody On Demand, there are plenty of, in, if you're interested in um, the programs on Beachbody On Demand, like the old school P90X, um, Shift Shop, uh, six, six Weeks of the Work, um, and the boxing based uh, workout program there, which is called 10 Rounds. Um, just check me out. Just check out all the uh, my link on the Pound for Pound Box Report blog page. Um, I am doing a fitness, a group fitness challenge. Let's go together group fitness challenge for November. It's based on the 10 Rounds program on Beach Body on Demand. If you're interested, um, I believe, uh, Gail, you're taking part of it, right? I am. Okay, okay, so yeah, yeah. so it Gail out. is going to take part, going to start on November the 2nd, right in time for the holidays, um, a boxing-based uh, program, and I see uh, um, my compadre over at Three Kings Boxing, uh, one of the HNICs over at Three Kings Boxing, um, head of media relations, Bo, what's going on, Bo? Hey, what's going on, man? I'm happy to be here with Miss Gail Falcon. About time, man. I was just asking about you saying, what is he doing? Is he sitting on his ass? What's the, what's the deal? Glad, <laughs> glad to have you back. Glad Thank to have you so you much. And uh, I don't know who, who, who is unrivaled. Oh, my name um, is Mark. Mark. My Mark. name is Mark. I'm from uh, Ireland. I have a channel on YouTube and I write some like freelance work for some newspapers in Ireland. I bet, bet. Yeah, I'm just glad to be here, man. Um, what can I say, man? Uh, man, what a weekend. Indeed, indeed. Again, if you want to check out all that information, go to the Pound for Pound Box Report blog page or just hit the description um, link below if you're checking us out live on YouTube. Let's get things going. Uh, let's just talk, just get into it right now. We all know what the big fight was this weekend. Uh, been talked about for months, months, a lot of hype on ESPN. Um, in particular, uh, that is with Silly Lomachenko, uh, Teofimo Lopez, um, lightweight unification bout, not undisputed, um, ESPN, not undisputed. Um, Lopez, and I'll go see you on this one first, Gail, and then you can follow up Bo and, and McGregor. Lopez surprised many by the way he performed. He won by decision, unanimous decision. Um 16, 10, 17, 11, and 19, uh, 10 on the three judges' scorecards. Tale of two halves, first half, second half. First half, uh, Lopez did a uh, – he surprised me by how patient he was. He surprised me how well he boxed. Loma, on the other hand, I don't know what he was doing. Um, he did too much surveying the scene, too much trying to look things through. And then once he discovered in round seven or so that – that he was behind, then he stepped it up. Lopez got the decision, Gail, but for me and um, others, how can I put this? It's been a lot of back and forth in the aftermath about the judges' scorecard. 
some felt that Lopez not just won, but dominated. There are others like myself and, and, and Bo and others who we can say we can feel that Lopez, if you feel that Lopez won, fine. But the judges were far too wide. I personally felt that way that 119, 110 card, that was just ridiculous. Even the 1711 card. That means you gave that means you gave Lopez 11 rounds on one card and like nine rounds on the other card. To me, there's no way. Your breakdown, your breakdown of the fight, Gail, were you surprised by what you saw from both men? And 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 speak a little bit on the scorecard itself. I was not only surprised, I was incredibly impressed at the way Lopez won. We all expected that if Lopez won, Lopez Jr. won, it would be uh, through a power shot, through a mistake. Lomachenko makes a mistake and Lopez Jr. tags him with more force, but in a similar way uh, as Jorge Linares did. That is not how it went down. It went down without him delivering any kind of power punch beat down like his previous fights. Instead, he took a page straight out of Lomachenko's playbook and beat him at his own game. He was crafty. He was patient. He didn't need a knockdown, a knockout. He didn't even need a knockdown to dominate. You know, this is a, a an opponent, a champion, a pound for pound, who had made some truly good fighters quit, had humiliated them. But if you aren't a believer now in Teofimo Lopez Jr., I don't know what more you can do. He has got to have made believers of any doubters left about what he's got to offer. Um, he was the busier fighter early. That was expected. Lomachenko is a notoriously you know, slow starter because he is usually in no hurry to show his cards. You know, you, he's, he's there. He's assessing. He's calculating. He'll throw a counter punch and he'll move. He just never got out of that mode. By about the third round, you had to think, well, what's he waiting for? Is he sitting there like a rattlesnake waiting to strike? He began to move a little better by round three or four, so at least we had something to look at. But that's when Lopez Jr. really started landing that right to the body. Uh, Lomachenko delivered a few headshots, but for the first half of the fight, there were was almost nothing to offer. He wanted, Lomachenko wanted to try to score, you know, almost in an amateur fashion without risking too much against Lopez Jr. But all it meant is that Lopez Jr. was the busier guy. He was fighting behind an absolutely terrific jab. He's, he's ripping those shots to the body. After five rounds, according to CompuBox, Lopez Jr. had thrown 170 punches. Lomachenko had thrown 40. That was the fight in a nutshell. Lopez Jr. was, I just can't tell you how impressed I was at how patient he was. He was efficient. He didn't have to swarm Lomachenko, but he never, ever stopped applying pressure. His footwork was excellent. I mean, he essentially outboxed. You know, he, out, he outskilled, if that's even a term, Lomachenko. Lomachenko didn't seem to wake up until the end of the seventh, eighth round. Now, finally, he seemed to come to life. And I did give Lomachenko rounds eight, nine, 10, and 11. But it was too late. You know, good defensive caution can't win a fight. He needed to get busy by the second or third round, to have any chance. And it just, it was that simple. It never happened. Now, I eventually ended up with a scorecard. You know, the second round was a bit of a push. But for me, it was a 116, 112, eight rounds to four fight. I wouldn't hate on, I wouldn't completely hate on a 117 card. Um, a card more extreme than that, and we're all, we're all looking at you, Julie Letterman, <laughs> was a little tough to justify. Um, you know, Las Vegas, what can we say? One positive though, a lot of people cringed 
when they heard Russell Mora was assigned as the, as the referee. Russell Mora was the perfect referee in that he was an absolute non-factor in the fight. You know, you barely even noticed he was there. The announcer said his name perhaps twice in 12 rounds. So that went down beautifully. Just not only a great win, a surprising and a skilled win from a fighter that we really expected to go in there and pound, and he didn't need to. Very, very impressive. I'll go to you. Um, I'll go to you, Unrivaled, then you can follow up Bo and Daniel. Uh, I will acknowledge what Gail said about how impressed she was with Lopez. However, once Loma finally woke up, um, he had the better of it the second half. So here's my question for you gentlemen. Was this fight about what Lopez did or was it about what Lomachenko didn't do? Well, for me, it was actually about what Tiafimo did. Um, he completely improved his lead hand activity on most of his fights. Um, it shot up by a four to one range in terms of his last few fights, just getting it out there, pumping the jab. But it wasn't just quickly pumping it out that was really successful to me it was how he reloaded it back to his body instantly like he'd pull it straight back extremely fast because if you notice a pattern with the seal whenever he's fighting against people what he likes to do is when they throw that jab he likes to roll slip under come up create a new angle that was gone and then he couldn't go to the other side because the check was waiting on him with the right hand so if he comes out to that way you saw that very quickly. Tiafimo was very fast to jump right in and throw that right hand if he came from that angle. So it kind of nullified it to, for some extent. So he was looking at a new way to up the pace. But whilst Lo uh, Lopez was still very fresh, he couldn't really do anything. So he's waiting to make him miss a little bit more to slow him down, which is what happened as the fight went on. Because the way Tiafimo started was very quick. As for how I scored the rounds, I thought the fight was really close, um, a lot closer than a lot of people. And um, when I was watching it live, I gave it six five and one even, and then uh, I rescored that one round and I gave it six uh, six six a draw, um, which is probably a bit crazy to think I had it six five and one even in favor of Loma. But uh, watching it back today, I'm I'm not upset with a seven five scorecard to Tia Fimo. I'm fine with it. I thought Loma landed actually more shots in some of the rounds that people just said Tiafimo dominated. He was landing on the arms. You can kind of see it. Um, one of them that landed on the body, um, grazing. Um, but it was it was it was a good fight. Um, some people were let down. Some people were saying it was a runaway. I don't know. I I wasn't too surprised though. Like with how. Loma performed because he did say it was going to be a chess match. So I expected him to fight it as though it was a chess match. I thought he would be naturally weary of the kid's power for a few rounds and then try and dissect them, which he started to do later on. Now I'll go to you, Bo. Now I, I preface this by saying that um, I was on um, with you and, and the um, head of Three Kings Boxing 2K on your show uh, uh, Friday, the night before the fight. And I have to admit, I uh, have to uh, eat a bit of crow here because I question um, the overall skill of, of Teofimo. What we saw Saturday, we hadn't, we didn't see that in his previous fights, and I also question uh, his trainer, um, his dad. Uh, but uh, he proved me wrong in terms of how he fought. Uh, were you as, as surprised in terms of? Uh, what he did from a skill perspective. And the question is still in, on the table for you, Bo, that I asked uh, um, Unrivaled. Was this fight more about what L Lopez did or was it about what Loma didn't do, particularly in the first half of the fight? It's a tale of both. No, uh, uh, what Lopez did uh, effectively made problems for Loma and Tango not to be able to do certain things he wanted to do. <clears throat> Let's make something clear. Um, it's kind of funny because uh, well, uh, Lo, uh, Lomachenko has fought Nicholas Walters and Guillermo Riquindia, and both those guys had been out a year. And you have a situation where Loma himself was out a year. And when you're 33 years old and you've been out of the ring for a year, um, you're not eager 
Like, it's not a matter of you being afraid to be touched, but you're not eager to get touched up. And Lomachenko became a victim of his own reputation. He took too long trying to think of what's going to work instead of just trying to, to see what's work. When he fights Luke Campbell, when he fights Anthony Croyer, when he fights some of those guys when he's busy, he tries it to see if it'll work. This time against uh, Tiffany Lopez, he did more thinking to see what was going to work before actually trying it. Uh, and it also goes to Teofimo Lopez. He came out laser focused. And the first thing he did, which reminded me of Marco Antonio Barrera, he was establishing the jab with the southpaw. And a lot of times people tell you, you know, the most effective punch is the right hand against the southpaw. Well, he was able to establish a jab and he was actually, he was mixing up with the hook. Um, when me and you was on the show, I said that if he's going to have to use that athleticism to keep up with Lomachenko footwork, he was able to do that. When Loma pivot, he was able to pivot. Um, but once Loma realized what the ultimate thing that was going to work, which was the same thing Tio was doing to Loma, he applied pressure. And once he realized, oh, applying pressure back is what's going to work for me, that's when you see it come on. Now, everybody talk about the scorecards. Um, uh, rounds two and round seven were tough rounds they were swing rounds i had uh lopez winning that fight seven to five okay but let me just say that 119 109 that is a card that you filled out on the airplane trip to las vegas that is not a card you actually sat there and you watched the fight 119 109 is you telling me i don't even want to see you in the ring anymore like i'm done with you which is ironic because Julie Letterman was one of the judges that actually uh, judged more Lomachenko fights. And the only thing I can think of is because of Lomachenko not being able to do what you normally used to see him doing, it gave the impression, oh, well, Lopez is dominating. But that scorecard takes away from how great of a fight this was. Um, back when I used to watch boxing way back in the day, the scorecards, even if you didn't watch the fight, you could hear the scorecards, and the scorecard pretty much told you the story of the fight. If you heard a scorecard that was 114, 115, 113, you're like, oh, man, that must have been a very good fight, so you wanted to watch that fight. This scorecard, 119-109, and even 117-111, those two scorecards is going to make it look like this guy dominated a top pound-for-pound guy, and that's not what that's not what happened, unfortunately. But at the end, look, um, Lopez did what he was supposed to do, which is he came out being the younger fighter, being the fighter with that extra gear. And I give him a lot of credit for this. I said, what's going to happen when he's going to have to bite down? And he showed me he has the ability to bite down because in the 12th round, his father told him, and hey, you have it, you know, just, just go ahead on and just cruise to boxing. He was like, no, nah, you don't know what these judges are thinking. I'm finna, I got to go out there and I got to take it. And that's the mindset you need when you're a young guy fighting a, a well-established champion like Lomachenko, you need that mindset. Like I'm going to go out here and I'm going to freaking take it. So um, I think it's a, it's a tale of both. There were things that Lopez did that pre that prevented Lomachenko from being able to do what he, for what he was able to do. And also credit to Lopez because when it comes to the mind game, the reason why Lomachenko was trying to figure out what's going to work is because Lopez gave him stuff to think about. So he didn't fall into the mind game trap of seeing what Loma's going to do and reacting to Loma. No, he made Loma react to him. It was sort of a role reversal. And like I said, man, it was a great fight. Um, I'm curious to see what he's going to do from here because now you, you know, when you take out the big dog, you got to understand the other dogs looking to get you. Mike, we talk about it. No, it's not undisputed. It's not undisputed all period. Uh, the, the WBC made it very clear that, it, first of all, it was a franchise tag. Then they made it a belt. Then they said it couldn't change hands. And, like, <laughs> at the fifth hour, oh, it can change hands. No. He's, this, this, is, this is not for undisputed. I understand that people are going to say it, and you're going to get pushed back on it. But as long as you still have a dude out there with a belt, uh, and, that, that, and if you go to the WBC website and they show him as the champion, then you can't, you, you can't say that's undisputed to me, man. Yeah, absolutely. And to that 119 one. Um, 10 car. You'll like this boat. It reminded me of that 118, 110 um, that that judge gave uh, Leonard over Hagler back in 87. Um, 
that card was just way wrong and out of pocket and, and that 119.10 card for uh lopez was way out of pocket i'll go to you daniel uh personally i had the fight i had the fight along the lines with Bo. i had it one seven rounds to five for for lopez your assessment of the fight uh, uh were you surprised by what by what you saw from each man and 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 um again was this was this on loma for not doing enough early on or was this on on lopez uh in, in terms of what he did uh to get the decision to me not so much what lopez did as much as what he didn't do he didn't do the mistake that a lot, if not all, almost of the major power punchers that have faced Loma before have done. Which is, the thought is, if you can just bum rush Loma, not get him to think, you'll land a shot and you'll win. We can go from fighter, we can go from fighter, fighter who has tried to do that, who has been known as a power puncher. And the results up to Saturday have been the same. Loma just outworks you when it comes to footwork, gauges your distance, and then once he realizes you don't have much of a plan, he strikes. Lopez didn't do that. Lopez actually was a patient fighter in this instance. He started with the jab. He started going to the body from the first round, but he wasn't trying to just go to the body and then immediately try to get a kill shot. He tanked the body with patience. He made sure that he didn't give Loma any sense that he thought it was just he was going to try to blitz through. And unfortunately for Loma, that tendency to start slow, like I know what they said was he was he was downloading data on, on his opponent. That ultimately was probably his undoing. Like he put himself in a very, very deep hole. In the first half of the fight, where he had to come in close, he had to come in and start applying pressure in the second half of the fight in order to stand a chance on the card. That's mainly a and that's mainly on also Papachenko because that means also that Papa Lomachenko thought the same thing oh, he's just going to be another young power puncher. He's going to try to bum rush through, do what you normally do. He's just going to fall like the rest. And when that didn't happen, when Loma applied pressure and Lopez didn't get flustered and get out of his game plan to it, in fact, he changed on it. If you notice a few times, I think it was like in round eight through 10, you started noticing that whenever Loma started to apply pressure, Lopez was sidestepping and then answering with a right uppercut. He didn't always land clean, but he was throwing an effective right uppercut. Pretty much letting Loma know, you're not going to just wither my confidence in this. And of course, he closed him in the 12th round. Like he, there, was, there was a good chance in the 12th round that if he wasn't going to be, if he wasn't going to knock him out, any other round, it would have been that one. The only probably the only issue, and this probably the only main issue that you have with Russell Moore is what he did in the last ten seconds of the fight. Okay, it's the last ten seconds. The guy's already done. Yes, I granted he's a cut. You could let go of it just for ten seconds and let the doctors know afterwards, because. It would have, at that point, it just would have taken a miracle shot from Loma in order to change the trajectory after the, the round that Lopez had. To me, those, the right scorecard was 116, 112. You can make the case for 115, 113. I have no problem with anybody doing it. But to me, 116, 112 was probably more the correct score. And yeah, and granted, when it comes to fights, it's more you get more on the loser. And, I have to say, yeah, Loma put himself in too much of a deep hole. You had to have noticed that by the fourth round that, okay, this kid is not acting like other power punchers. 
he's actually being patient and he's actually hurting me. I have to counteract now rather than wait until round seven. Into the aftermath here because there's a lot of questions uh, that needs to be asked. Um, I'll get the conversation started with you, Bo. Um, in terms of what's going to happen here for both men, uh, let's start with Lom let's start with Lomachenko first. A uh, lot of news. It, it news broke during the week that there's not going to be a rematch clause. Uh, given how the fight went, given that he suffered a defeat, um, in hindsight, was Loma stupid, for lack of a better word, for not putting a rematch clause in the contract, or? Uh, did he just do or, or or did he just omit it because was it just the case that this was going to be his one final fight at 135 pounds and that he was going to move on or probably move meaning move on meaning move down to 130 regardless win or lose no he wasn't stupid at all period because the reality was this was the last fight at 135 for both of those guys uh <clears throat> lomachenko is tapped out at 135 so he's going to go back to 130 and and uh we all know tiffany lopez has made it very clear, his father's made it very clear on several occasions whenever you talk to him, that after this, they're going to go to 140 because there's nothing left for them to do at the division. So, which I disagree, that you still have something to do with division. You need to fight Devin Haney for true undisputed, but whatever. Um, so, no, it, it wasn't dumb to not uh, 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 get a rematch because either way it go, both of these guys, it was going to be the end. It You know, like, that, that, that was going to be it for both of these guys at that, at 135. So, um, I also think some of it might have been a situation of uh, Lomachenko was was you know was confident in hey man I'm, I'm gonna win, you know I'm I'm gonna win anyway so you know what's the, what's the point of the rematch I'm gonna win, and um, because you can also I don't know if Tiafimo them even had a rematch clause because if they didn't have a rematch clause then you definitely know that their mind frame was the same as Lomachenko this is it for us right here we we're, we're we're moving on after this so uh, I think a lot of times though. Um, people get caught up in wanting to have rematch clauses. When a fight is great, you don't necessarily need a rematch clause running back. Uh, uh, think uh, Deontay Wilde and Tyson Fury after the first fight, there was no rematch clause, but Deontay gave it to him anyway. So when fights are great, you don't need a rematch clause running back, man. These, these guys know that the, the business of boxing will always let you know when a rematch is warranted and you'll do it. Um, Roley Romero gave a rematch. He's given a rematch to that that that, uh, that Dominican cat that he had fought. So um, not all the time do you need to have it because what, what winds up happening is you get the rematch clauses and um, there are other fights that can be going on right then at that time. Sometimes a fighter should should actually say, you know what, man, go ahead on and take a fight. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sit this one out, gather myself and heal up. You go ahead on and take a fight. I'll go ahead on and take a fight. Then we'll meet each other. And you can build the fight better because if you get beat badly in a, in a fight, people are going to be too eager to see the rematch. But if you get beat badly, you take a fight and you dominate, then they might say, you know what, man, maybe he learned something from it. So I think there's too much overemphasis in rematch clauses in boxing. Now I'm going to run it back. Up to you, Bo. Before, but beforehand, I want to uh, give a shout out to um, Intangible Boxing News uh, for joining us on the show. I want to thank Fabrizio for the, for subscribing. Um, let's talk about let's talk about Teofimo. Um, you mentioned um, Devin Haney, mm -hmm. and yet I know his dad said that after the fight they're moving up to 140 pounds. But for me, I think there's still one more fight for Teofimo. At 35, and that's the aforementioned Haney. Haney, he is the WBC champion. Again, sorry, ESPN. You shouldn't uh, mislead the public like that. He is the WBC champion. They've been beefing and talking about each other on, on, on social media for years. Uh, we know there's history between the two. We know they're sparred, they've sparred each other. They've talked about each other. Trap, they talked trap. What do you call uh, tail female called Haney the uh, email champion yeah, or something like that? Right. And Haney has a fight coming up against Gamboa in November. Uh, you got the situation at 140 with uh, uh, Ramirez and Josh Taylor. Uh, am I wrong in think and, and, and in looking at the fight? We know Teofimo has issues has issues making weight, but he made it against Lomachenko. He didn't necessarily, and he was okay after the fight. Um, it wasn't a thing of him being 
two two drain. I think he could do it one more time at one thirty five for the real undisputed and fight Devin Haney. Should he do that, or should, or are they, or do you think they're just going to move up to one forty just regardless? Uh, if I'm in Tia Fimo's camp, I'm telling him to go to one forty and fight Devin Haney at one forty. And here's the reason why is. You're, you're really struggling. His father made it very, very clearly clear that it's really hard for his son to make 135. So if you're already having a hard time, a tough time making 135, and you're going to fight a cat like Devin Haney, you don't want to fight him while you're st when you're pretty much weakening yourself to to make weight. Uh, so for me, if I'm in this camp, I'm saying, yeah, man, go to go to 140 because eventually Devin Haney's, you know, he's going to come to 142. So you can fight him at your more natural weight where it's better for you. Uh, should he fight him at, at 135? Of course, I think he should. But if I'm in his camp, I'm advising him not to. And and, and I'm going to say it again, man. I know people are going to – the the thing about Undisputed is going to be argued uncontinuously. But the bottom line is when the organization couldn't even explain to you what the rules were when the inception of it comes. I take you back to me. So Suleiman said – it's confusing to me too, right? So you took this from a franchise tag to making it a franchise belt. You took it from being it can't, it's not something you can lose now to something you can be lose just for this fight. No, I'm sorry, I, I can't, I can't go with something that you can't even explain yourself. And if we allow them to make shit up as they go along, then we're just as guilty as they are in being complicit with the the bad shit that happens in boxing. Uh, there's no way we should be allowing this, knowing that, hey, man, you guys made him a franchise and Devin Haney on your website is shown as your WBC champion. No, there's there's no way you can, you, you know where you can say undisputed. ESPN was saying four belt champion. Now, all of a sudden, it, the franchise tag became a belt, but it was a tag that became a belt that couldn't be transferred over. And all of a sudden, just for this one fight was transferred over. If we allow, if we allow this organization that, has made this up as they went along, could not explain it since the exception. And, oh, and by the way, the month of the fight decided to say, oh, it's going to be for undisputed. If we allow them to do that, then we're just as guilty as everybody else for whatever, for the bad shit that happens in boxing. And we need to just right now say, okay, it's okay to screw all these guys and, 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 and allow them to get this tag so they don't have to fight nobody coming up no more because it's criminal what the fucking WBC just did, man. And short, hold them accountable. Uh, of how the whole basically just hold them accountable. They just, you, as watchers, as listeners, as media folks, you just can't allow that stuff to get away, to allow them to get away with it. You just can't allow them to just mix shit up as they go along. Um, I'll go to you, uh, uh McGregor, and then and you can follow uh, Unrival, and then you can follow up, uh, Gail, future of Lomo, future of uh, Tail Female. What you think? Um. I don't know with Loma. I think he's going down to 130. That seemed to be the gist of things anyway, that he was going to go down to 130, win or lose after this fight. Um, for Tio, I think he's going up to 140. There's some good fights from up there. Um, I'd like to see him in there with Zapata, which probably won't happen. Maybe Jack Catterall. They can get that to happen in the meantime while Ramirez and Taylor get going so he can get acquainted with the weight. Maybe uh, Cesar Cano. Some good fights from there. Um as for, like, if he wants to stay at 135, he should fight Devin. That'd be a cool fight to have. Me, personally, I hold a different account of things to you guys. And you know the way y'all were saying, like, hold them accountable for the shit they're doing? The WBC, I don't recognize them as a sanctioning body anymore. That's my thing. There's no point. It's too confusing. You've got, like, 42 champions. So... I, I, I can't I can't keep up with it. They they're like the WBA only worse. The super <laughs> title at least there's a little bit of a difference, but this is something where you can be a champion, but you're not a champion, but you can win a diamond belt, but you can get a designation that gets sent over to you while you're carrying receipts that are two belts but only one belt but isn't a belt. That's too complicated. It's like playing Cluedo in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Mauricio and Suleiman's turning into Oprah. You get a bell. You get a bell. Speaking of bells, um, there was an 
extensive post-fight news conference. In fact, I was surprised how long first Lopez Sr., then Lopez Jr. helped court. Right. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was yeah. extensive. You're right yeah. about that, Gail. Yeah. Lopez Sr. was adamant. He saw no reason for his son to stay at 135. He said he's been suffering at this weight for seven years. And I understand that. I do. And I respect that. He feels he needs to move to the 140-pound division to take on the champions there. Now, here's what's interesting. The fight coming up on the Usyk Chisora undercard between George Cambosos Jr. and Lee Selby is for the IBF mandatory against Lopez Jr. Should he stay at 135? He probably won't. So I don't know what that means. It means sort of meaningless. What seemed to light Lopez Jr. up was the thought of, listen, if Jose Ramirez and Josh Taylor unify and I move up, I fight the winner and I win, I unify another division in record time. And he seems very eager for that accomplishment. And he'll probably need to do a mandatory or a tune up or something before then. Uh, really, a tune up if he's going to 140. I just can't see him staying at 135. He did mention fighting Devin Haney. He was specific about take, take it to 140. And he says, I love messing with everybody, man. So when asked about a rematch, his exact quote, which was striking, he said, would he entertain a rematch? And he said, for what? For what? They didn't give me a rematch clause for a reason. He's got to suck it up now. Out with the old, in with the new. He made his attitude very, very clear. So as for Lomachenko, he's going to drop down. 130 would not be a terribly difficult division for him. What about fighting the winner of, of Bertelt and Valdez? Eh, I don't see it. Oscar's not going to uh, – no. I mean, I uh, so. if Bertelt win, Oscar's not going to let that happen. I, I think he will want a clean slate. And moving down to a smaller weight division, I don't think he'll move down as far as 126. But I do think he'll move to 130 and try to rebuild his legacy. I, I think he just needs to leave this weight division behind. And I think that is going to be his reason it, it for losing the fight. You can call it an excuse, perhaps, that he was fighting you know, a guy way too heavy for him. If that's what it takes for him to straighten his head around and move forward, okay, we'll see. I, I do think he's got a, a lot of soul searching to do. His father in the corner kept telling him, be patient, be patient. Be patient for what? A meteor to strike? Lopez Jr. in the middle of the ring? Well, what the hell was he waiting for? It was a frustrating fight to watch because you know that talent is there. Was it ring rust? Was he afraid of losing by knockout and preferred to lose the way he did? Being nibbled to death the whole way down, it's hard to say. Final question. I'll get the conversation with, started with you, Daniel, and then everybody else can follow up. Given the current state, given how boxing has gone uh, this year, sport being kind of uh, put on hold due to uh, COVID-19, the pandemic that's ongoing, let's just say nothing major or upset or anything happens uh, for the fights later on this year. Does this win make Teofimo Lopez the 2020 fighter of the year? No. No. Uh, you said it doesn't make I'd probably say uh, he's in yeah. the running. Uh-huh. Wait. No. He's, like I said, I would say he's in the running, but it doesn't mean to make it in that point about it because it's come so it's come so close. And this year is going to be very, very tough to gauge, unfortunately, because of the way the pandemic has worked. Uh, now, now, if we did a hurry up like really, really fast and fought Haney 135, that that would be really nice because it just mainly depends on how everything 
needs to shake up. He is he's gonna get consideration just because of the fact of who he beat. But I don't think he's fully locked in that area. Now, I do hope though, like I'll say this because I because I know it's probably the last topic. I do really hope that he doesn't do what Bud did. That one of my biggest regrets watching Bud, like when in the 140s, he didn't at least defend the undisputed belts at least once. If Fimo can do it against Haney, and if it's a close fight, okay, hey, let's do it at 140. You already have something that's established. But at the same time, like, like I said, I would say he's in the run. If we're looking at Lopez, he's in the running. I wouldn't say yet. But we have to see yeah, how this year shapes up. Because as Gail famously notes, almost every time this year, even when even when you put in that qualifier, Mike, the pandemic gets a vote. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, here, here's the thing. Um, I could see him being in a running, but when you look at, I, I, there, there are so many things you can look at. Um, for me, if you just ask me who's the fighter of the year for 2020, I would have to tell you Tyson Fury. Nobody saw him beating the hell out of Deontay Wilder the way he did, especially coming back from what happened in that first fight. Uh, I can definitely, like, that would be my number one. Lopez being Loma would definitely be number two uh, because, uh, but then you got other fights going on that this year. So it's, right now, if you were to ask me, I have Tyson Fury number one, Lopez number two. Yeah, the year is far from over, and we have a fairly busy schedule the next eight weeks or so. And don't you all forget Clay Collard. Come on, he's in the conversation. <laughs> Didn't Clay Collard test positive for COVID? Oh, one of his team did. One of his okay. Team, then he did. Yeah, he was supposed to be on the undercard. Oh, oh, he'll be back. Well, that'll be his fifth fight. Fifth fight in the bubble. Sixth fight this year. Come on. <laughs> He's trying to run these bouts through like Buck Smith used to do back in the day. What say you, McGregor? Uh, it's between Fury and it's between Lopez right now. Um someone's gonna need to do something. I mean who knows? Maybe Kuba Pula have knocked out Joshua inside two rounds and he's fired the year. Who knows? <laughs> could, oh, it could happen. It could, hey, Pavek can knock out Dillian White. Now, that was if a Pavek, Actually, if Pavek can knock out Dillian White that. again, if he knocks out Dillian White yeah. again, I'd give it to him. Yes. That, yes. that yes. I agree with. I agree with that. Yep, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Remains to be seen. Um, let's move on to a fight on the undercard. Don't forget Jessica and McCaskill. Yeah, yes, about her. Yes, thank, yes. You. thank you very much for one for her win over a uh, uh, breakers earlier this year. I, I didn't think about that. Yeah, but yeah, don't yeah, they have a separate right. ruling? Don't they have like a separate category, like a women's footer of the year and a men's footer of the year? Footer of the year. Um, you know, technically no, but a lot of us have started adding. So that there are two, so they don't have to compete with each other. It's sort of like you know, best best actor, best actress. Do you combine them? Do you keep them separate? Um, for now, they're still separate. Okay. Let's move on to one other fight that I want to focus on in terms of this card, or oh, one fighter to be specific. Wait, wait, wait. Um, before, before. Go ahead. Wait, 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 Mike, 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 Mike. Mike. I, I just need to say something. Wait, Bo. How much? How much did that hurt? How much did that hurt you to say that? To say what? Or did it give you like flashbacks of, of Breckers losing again? Oh. Reminding them how Breckers <laughs> lost. <laughs> you mean uh, Jessica McCaskill beat Cecilia Breckers? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Uh, how much did it hurt me? Yep. It hurt because that is one fine motherfucker right there. <laughs> but at the same time, hey man, hey man, home team, baby. I, I, I it, it, it eased up because That's right, she is from team. Chicago. That's right. Yeah, it, it eased up a little bit because it was home team. So, but yeah, no, nah, it was, you know, it it stung a little bit, but you know, it, it wasn't one that I, I can't survive from. It, it hurt me. Like, it wasn't like it was Gail that broke my heart or anything like like she did Chavez Junior. It <laughs> hurt me. Hey, it hurt hey, me. hey, hey, haven't you heard? We broke up. Come on. <laughs> nah, this this one this one hurt me because I love Cecilia. Cecilia is what got me into women's boxing, and I bet ground on her as well. So I really hurt. Ooh, 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 yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, more ways than one. Yeah, your financial hit. Yeah, I can understand that. Boy. Yeah. Let's move on to go ahead, Bo. I said, do we have another Gus in the room? <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Gus, man. Shout out to Gus. Shout out to Gus. Um, or EJ. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Shout out to the homie EJ over in um over in the UK. Um, one fighter I want to talk about who was fought on this card. That's um, Belanga, Edgar Belanga, uh, rising middleweight, super middleweight. He fought a guy by the name of Bellows, and I, I'll go to you. I'll go to you, McGregor, if you fought, saw this fight. Okay, he quote unquote TK him in one. First off, I thought it was a quick stop. And second and more importantly, um, top rank of giving a lot of this, this guy a lot of hype lately. Uh, you saw the coverage on ESPN if you watched it there on the stream. And they're making this guy out to be basically another coming of a, a Julian Jackson or Gerald McClellan, a big punching guy. Here's my question. Based on what you've seen from him, is he worthy of the hype? He's got a lot of power. Uh, well, what seems to be a lot of power. I mean, but for me, <laughs> I don't think he's worthy of the hype he's getting. I see other prospects who've impressed me way more in that division, like Melakuzia, you know, um, who did a number on a very good fighter, in my opinion, Vaughn Alexander, who's tough as nails. I'd love to see Berlanga in there with somebody like uh, Vaughn, because we know Vaughn will take him rounds and hurt him and make him struggle and tire him. Um, I don't, he's just loading up on power punches from start to finish, isn't he, really? Landing on people, hitting them, and the referees are just stepping in for half of these stoppages, just like, yeah, it's over. He's landed a punch on you, you're out. I need to see more. I haven't seen the kid throw a jab. I actually haven't seen him beat somebody to a jab yet. The two jabs that he threw against Bellows, Bellows actually landed before him, and there was a massive reach disparity, so... I don't know. I don't know. He looks powerful, what, though. Yeah, what say, what say everyone else in the um, panel? Well, say what well, you will about Linnell Bellows, who, who came to boxing late in his career. He uh, was a football player. He uh, had never been stopped. He's never been stopped in 27 fights. So Berlanga was expected to at least go some rounds. I found the first round knockout in this fight a bit surprising. Um, you know, he reminds me a lot of Lopez Jr. Everybody said, oh, well, this next fight, no, he's going to be ex exposed or, you know, he's not that good. And uh, he kept passing the test, passing the test. I, we do need to see Berlanga go more than a round. It's not going to serve him well in the long run if he doesn't get somebody a little more rugged who can stand up to the punches, who can show him something a little more technically sound. Um, but I think there's plenty of talent there, and God knows there's plenty of attitude. So I can take a guy a long way. Um, well, I thought the when a guy has never been knocked out or even uh, resembling being hurt or knocked down, you got to give him a chance. Now, I did pick Berlanga winning by first round knockout. But I thought the referee should at least gave the guy he fought a chance. I mean, this guy has never been knocked out before. So you got to give him a chance at least to touch the canvas and see what happens. Uh, so I thought it was a bit early. I mean, it was enough time left in the round, so he probably would have still got him out of there. But if now that I've seen what I've seen, my thought process is, okay, that's it. No more of these type of fighters. Now you need to fight somebody in the top 15. Top 15, top 10. That's what you got to do now. because. Uh, Knocked everybody out in the first round. So there's nothing to prove with the D and C level fighters. You clearly you're above them. Now we need to see you with the B's and the A's. So that's what I'm saying. Top 15, top 10 fighters. Your next opponent should be like a Jose Uskateki, uh Anthony Durrell. Uh, you know, you know, guys of that caliber. You know, that's what you need to be focusing on. Uh hell, hell, even a Chris Eubanks freaking, you know, junior. You know, somebody that will test you. And we can see those rounds because we're interesting. It's interesting to see what happens 
once he gets into those second, third, and fifth rounds where he got to pull the extra gear when there's not there's not a lot of you know stuff on on the punches right now. You know, uh, hell, uh, you know, David Lemieux, uh, you know, stuff like that. So those are the guys we I I want to see him in. Stop with these dudes. Stop with these guys that they're feeding him. Obviously, he can beat them. Clearly, he can beat them. You know what I'm saying? Look at the Jurgen Bramers. Uh, look at the, like I said, David Lemieux, the, you know, uh, Durrell's, uh, uh, Anthony Durrell, uh, Jose Uskateki. Look at those guys now. Look at the, the really, really, really more doable guys that we know are doable at that level. I wouldn't hate that. Wouldn't hate that at all. Mm-hmm. One last, uh, uh, kind of boxing topic I want to talk about. I didn't put mention in the chat. Um, some controversy has arose over the fight that took place this weekend between um, Luis Ritson and, and Miguel Vasquez. Uh, Ritson won the fight by a split decision. A lot of people felt he did not deserve the win. But in the aftermath of that, um, British Board of Boxing, British Boxing Board of Control um, has launched an investigation um, into uh, ringside judge Terry O'Connor. Uh, in the aftermath of the bout, uh, after the bout, I should say, Eddie Hearn of Matchroom um, posted a picture on Twitter in which O'Connor was apparently uh, observing, looking at it, looking through his cell phone, uh, his smartphone during the fight. Uh, for anybody who wants to pick this up, bad enough that Ritson got a decision he, a lot of people felt he didn't deserve. But on top of that, the issue with O'Connor, uh, what does this say? Uh, referees checking out their phone in the middle of the fight when their focus should be on the ring? What the hell? Well, I think the thing is, it appears to be a phone. Some people are saying he looked at it. I saw somewhere they said um, he was looking at a scorecard, not a phone. Um, at the end of the day, you know, the judging for years have always been something we've scratched our head out. But particularly 2020 seemed to have thrown everybody the freak off. The only thing that worked it well was the replay with the so-called knockdown that happened. I think it was Alex Aceto fight. That actually worked it kind of well with that replay. They, they they didn't take very long. They called it what it was. But um, for, for, first, let me just say this. For, for Eddie Hearn to do that, to release that video, that, that's that's kind of wrong. He should have took that to the British Boxing Board of Control. <clears throat> when you release that video in the air and you say that, hey, he was looking at his phone, that's what people are going to think they're looking at is him looking at his phone because it's the power of suggestion. You know, like, if I was to say something that's not true, like Daniel is pretty, that's the power of suggestion. We know <laughs> that is nowhere near being accurate. <laughs> you let me tell you had to still you had to step away for a second. <laughs> you know, but he shouldn't have done that. He should have I heard him. I heard him. Uh, <laughs> he should have said, hey, I think this guy's looking at his phone and give it to the British Boxing Board of Control. Let them launch an investigation before the public opinion can be deemed to how they're going to sway this. So I think that was completely wrong. But let's keep it real, though. That fight, I will forever be a Lewis Richton fan. Because when I can't sleep, that's the fight I'm going to watch. When I can't get any sleep, when I have, you know, when, when I can't close my eyes, when I've been up all night so long that I can't sleep, I'm going to watch Lewis Riston because he really truly is the Sandman. Hell, he put me to sleep without throwing a punch. So <laughs> that's the fight I'm definitely going to watch. Now, I will say this. I'm glad that they're investigating it. I think boxing should, should do that more often. We should do that over here more often. But I think it's wrong the way Eddie Hearn went about it because when you put it out there in the ether like that, you leave it up for public opinion to sway people. Because, mind you, he don't put that video out. People don't start getting outraged. <laughs> do the British Boxing Pro- boxing Board of uh, Control do an investigation? Probably not. <clears throat> but when you say it's a cell phone, without making, confirming it's a cell phone, like I said, because people are saying he, looked at a, a, he was looking at a scorecard. But the bottom line was he shouldn't have put that out there. Should have took the, hey, I got this video. I think he's looking at cell phone. Please investigate. That would have been done a heck of a lot better to me, in my honest opinion. 
Yeah, watching him fight is uh, the equivalent of taking a couple of melatonin to get you some sleep for the for insomnia. Um, no doubt about that. Um, I want to give a shout out to uh, um, Lance Mayer in the chat. Uh, sound, he says salute to pound for pound boxing and unrival boxing um, talking news. He also said that LOL, uh, that's what the judges are doing with these wild cards. I'll go to everybody else who wants to um, have anything to say about this issue with O'Connor and the fight itself. Um, anybody? Yeah, I'll go for sure. Um, <clears throat> first thing first, I want to I want to say this. Uh, Eddie Herndon isn't the one who put that video out there that was done by oscar bevis uh someone who's worked for ifl tv and boxing social and other media outlets uh, in on youtube and eddie didn't do it until robert smith had already seen it as well who is the secretary of the british boxing board of control and um, he'd already seen it because he responded to a comment on it about two hours before eddie even retweeted or said anything so i, I do need to say that um just just to be fair and honest to the situation. Um as for as for the scorecard, it was ridiculous, but I'm not surprised with Terry O'Connor. Um we know he, him to be an inept judge anyway, one of the worst who probably should have been fired years ago when he was in the ring and blatantly robbed John McDermott against Tyson Fury 98-92 as the referee in the first fight with John McDermott and Tyson oh, Fury. Oh, yeah. I remember the fight a lot of people felt that yeah, Fury about that. lost. Yeah. Yeah, he was. Uh, that was the referee who was giving the referee scorecard ninety eight, ninety two. You know, Fury apparently won eight rounds to two in that. <laughs> he does this quite a lot. He's uh, he tends to be a henchman for Frank Warren and McKennessy. He tends to be one of their cronies, one of their friends, and he tends to give certain results. And especially with British fighters, he also tends to go against certain fighters of a certain persuasion when they're fighting against other fighters of a certain persuasion. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of disappointing. If you look at that actual card and rewatch the Assembler versus uh, uh, Martin Joseph Ward fight, uh, where there was a clash of heads and there was a cut, he actually scored that. Uh, he scored that like a seven rounds to one in favor of Ward. Um, everybody that I spoke to thought it was either close to a draw or Assembler was winning. Um, he does this regularly, and. Yeah, this man needs to get out anyway. As for the whole scorecard thing and the phone thing, um, watching the video, I did see it bend. So I don't think it's a phone. Phones don't normally bend like that. However, you're not supposed to be looking at your scorecard in the middle of action. What if you miss a punch? You know, that's three seconds gone. What if you miss a right hook? What if that's the thing that decides around? Uh, it's incompetence. And from what I heard, uh, from someone who was there, a little member of media, said that he was trying to justify why he gave his scorecard to his uh, little cronies, talking about small little stuff like, well, uh, Lewis, he landed the power shots of Vasquez. Uh, nine of his jabs was worth one of Lewis Ritson's uh, power shots. is just retarded in its core. It's, sorry for the use of that word, but it, it's just stupidity. It's stupidity. How how are you supposed to get away with something like that? Saying yeah, one power shot equals nine jabs and a right hook because the other dude doesn't hit that hard. That's not how it works. You show your incompetence with that statement. He's senile. He's old. He's been involved in many robberies in the UK. He never gets called out. Uh, there's been many people who've speculated that he either places bets on fights. Which, by the way, if it wasn't the scorecard, it could have been his betting ticket, couldn't it? Could also have been that. Unless he's able to prove it was his scorecard. Can't just take him at his word. His word doesn't mean anything if you look at his yeah, scorecard. Because I find it interesting that you normally they keep him in front of them so they can see. I found it interesting he has it bent and his arm was arms folded. I thought that was kind of strange. Yeah, very strange. But then again, he is fat and old, isn't he? I don't <laughs> like him. So he's probably trying to relax as much as he can. I can't stand Terry O'Connor ever since I met him four years ago. He doesn't smell. He does, it, he, you know one of those people who doesn't even smell nice, just smells kind of disgusting. He looks Damn. and is how he is. I don't like him. I don't want them in the sport. I think he's been involved in match fixing for years. So, <laughs> Tell us how you really feel. Tell us how you really feel. Uh, yeah, anybody I, else? I think Go he ahead. is related to Gus, man. He's got to be. 
<laughs> you mean a uh, rival? <laughs> yeah, he, he has to be. <laughs> Gus will probably Gus will probably say the same thing. No, 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 no. no. Um, No, no, wait. No, he has to talk cryptocurrency before he, we can officially say that he's with Gus. <laughs> I can link you in a para link if you want. <laughs> Let's move on. Um, ah, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't mention the news in the docket because I just didn't see much noteworthy news. Uh, so I'm going to give everyone here an opportunity if there's anything that you found uh, newsworthy uh, uh, to talk about it uh, but right now. So the floor is to anybody in the panel who um, saw anything that perked their interest in, in, in the boxing landscape. Yes, I did. Uh, every now and then I like to troll, see what's going on. And I couldn't help. But the troll Miss Gail Falkenthal. Oh. I saw a picture of Gail with her bright red hair and her 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 her, her little uh, matching mask on, and I swear to God, her cheeks was pumped up, and I was like, "Is she smiling with a mask on? What is the point of that?" And I just had to ask, "Why are you smiling with a mask on, Gail? You can't see it." Why not? Why the hell not? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't you know the art of the smize? Don't you know? Haven't you followed Miss Tyra Banks? You all how to smile without having the grin? Come on. I'm just a cheerful gal. What can I say? <laughs> Anyone else? Because okay, um, well, I, outside of the um, Andrade flight, because I, I refuse. You might that before. Now, I have standards. Well, now you might. We we do get <laughs> we do get well, media. I think McGregor might actually know there is. Uh, uh, there is no noteworthy. We do um, have media workouts, virtual media workouts scheduled back to back tomorrow and Wednesday for Gervonta Davis and Leo Santa Cruz. Those will be streamed live on the Showtime Sports YouTube channel. So you see, you can see Santa Cruz tomorrow at what will be two o'clock Eastern time. And Gervonta Davis will be at 9 p.m. Eastern time Wednesday night. So you get a little look at him. And I'm interested to see how close to weight Tank really is. We all know that's what we're going to be looking at Wednesday night. Mm, mm. What were you going to say, Daniel? <laughs> oh, well, actually, McGregor may know this. Any truth to this rumor that Pula broke his hand and it looks like Josh was going to be fighting Charles Martin again? Fake rumor coming from the fake Michael Benson account that was originally the fake Boxing Kingdom account that was originally the fake Eubank Senior account. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's an impressive provenance. I uh, I had to make sure because that Jesus Christ, that guy has said so many names. Indeed, indeed. So let's. Uh, it wouldn't be surprising uh, though. Like Pulev does all of these things, and then when he finally has the shot. Yeah, I was on Pulev's official Facebook page yesterday. He's confirmed that he's fighting only yesterday, so no, no truth to the rumors. Because normally Pulev posts on Facebook when he's pulling out like four days before mainstream media gets it because he's only got like, like 4,000 followers and they all speak Russian. So. Yeah. Um, other thing I can think of, only thing, other oh. thing I can think of is... Um, Julio Cesar Mar Mar Martinez, he's... a. Uh, He's going to be defending his, his title against a different opponent. Yeah, uh, we're going to um, jump on that. Only other thing I can think of is the uh, Joshua Franco against Maloney. Uh, Franco defeated Maloney earlier this year um, in Las Vegas to win a interim belt at 115 pounds. Well, they're going to fight a rematch um, on the on the card of Crawford Brook um, November 14th in Vegas. So be on the lookout uh, look out for that. 
um, Andrew Maloney, um, the young of the twin brother of, of the other. I, I keep forgetting it, getting the um, names confused. Um, uh, the, I guess the other Maloney brother who's going to fight um, in a way. Jason, on, on, Jason Maloney. Jason Maloney is going to fight in a way on um, Halloween. Let's move on and um, start previewing some fights here. Uh, I'm going to be a triple header that uh, featuring the aforementioned um, Julio Cesar Martinez, who will be instead, who's going to instead, who was set to fight, give me a quick second, folks, who was set to fight Maximo Flores. He's now going to fight an unknown fighter by the name of um, Calleros. But let's talk about the other two fights on that card. It's going to happen in Mexico City. Um, I'll go to you on this one, Gail, because you've been hearing some things about whether some of these fights will go off or whether the event will go off in itself. The headline, well, cold headline by two bouts. Um, Chocolatito, Roman Gonzalez is going to fight Israel Gonzalez. Um, Juan Frisco Estrada is going to fight uh, Carlos Quadras. Roman is going to defend his uh, WBA title at 115 pounds. Um, Gallo is going to defend his WBC title at 115 pounds. Uh, talk about the fights itself, but also what you kind of disclose to us uh, during the pre-show about some troubles behind the scenes with this entire card yeah we've got some of the top flyweights in the world all on the same card not necessarily fighting each other you know roman gonzalez has made a run back toward the top uh resurrecting himself for, from some devastating losses uh to sore wrong beside so the top of the card is gallo estrada versus carlos cuadras who has had top fights uh, in the flyweight division, but but Quadras has also had some sketchy issues with weight, with PED allegations. Um, he looked horrible um, in his marquee fight a few years back. Um, and there has been some buzz, nothing substantiated, that he may not make the fight. And that if he doesn't, the rumor has it, and it is a rumor, we're reporting a rumor, that Chocolatito would step in and fight Gallo anyway, which is where these two bouts are in theory leading is to that long awaited rematch between the two, that um, if Quadras is out, hell, they'll just put Chocolatito up against him. I have a problem believing that. This is a TV studio fight uh, it's not been well promoted. The truth is the Loma Lopez fight really took a lot of the air out of the room anyway. The flyweights after they had a nice, nice run and a uh, lot of very well promoted group cards sort of have gone a little bit quiet. I, I'd, I'd love to see the fight. I mean, no question. It's a fight I think we'd all love to see. I'd be a little disappointed, though, if it didn't get a proper you know, if it didn't get proper promotion, but it sounds like there is some trouble with that card. So I'd stay tuned everybody to see what that final bout sheet really does look like on Friday after the weigh-in. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I was watching, um, while this, we're doing this live show, I'm watching, um, Arizona Cardinal just embarrass the Cowboys right now. And I love it. Um, I'll go to you, uh, McGregor. And then you can follow up Bo. Let's talk about the fights. It's the fights themselves. Um, Chocolatito's fighting Israel Gonzalez. Israel, um, two-time world title challenger, um, lost uh, by TKO to uh, current IBF champion, 115 pounds, German Ancanas, in 2018. Um, he lost to the guy that um, Roman beat for the uh, WBA belt, Calia Fly. Gave a decent account of himself. Uh, your thoughts on that bout? I'm going with Choco Latito uh, by possible stoppage here. And in terms of the uh, Estrada bout with Quadras, I felt that Quadras was old and over the hill and shot Warren to begin with. And now given the news of about the possible issues with weight, um, I feel even stronger that Gallo is going to win, is going to win um, in a resounding fashion. So your thoughts on these two fights? Yeah, first of all, I, I kind of like the Israel Gonzalez versus Roman Chocolatito Gonzalez fight. Uh, I do favor Roman to win, but it's 
the reason I enjoy the fight is because I actually think Israel Gonzalez is a solid fighter. Yes, he did lose to year when via 10th round stoppage. And if you want, you can say he lost to Cal Yafoy. I ain't going to do it. He beat Cal Yafoy eight rounds to four, easy money, nine rounds to three. Anybody with a set of boys can tell you that in Monte Carlo. It was one of those Monte Carlo robberies uh, that you see every now and then with Matchroom. Um, I thought it was disgusting. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. But since then, he did just come off of a solid enough win over Shawashida. Shawashida is a good fighter. Uh, he boxes long, moves well, good good changes unilaterally. But I think Chocolatito will get on top of him, pin him down, do what Cal Yafoy couldn't do and take him out like rounds seven, eight, or nine. But he'll he'll make it difficult in the beginning. He does move really well. He's got a good job, kind of a little bit like Canizales down at 108. And then uh, the main event... Um, <clears throat> I'll be honest, I have zero intrigue in. Yeah, it's Estrada. He's coming off of an injury and a layoff, and he's he's a great fighter, but Carlos Cuadras hasn't quite been the same since his acne got better, really. Um, yeah. Make of that what you will. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he, Well, he hasn't. He hasn't. Like... Carlos didn't look too good in his last couple of fights himself. Like when he was when he fought against Ricardo Nunes, he didn't look all that. Uh, don't forget he got outpointed by McWilliams of Royal, who WBO champion and um, Kazuto Yoka made look like he didn't exist really, except for one round. So uh, he hasn't quite been the same since that Estrada fight. I think Estrada finished him off, the punch and damage he took from Arroyo, and then he didn't look great against Nunes, and then since then he's fought <sighs> subpar opposition. I, I reckon Estrada will run away with that, probably either on points or late stoppage. Yeah, um, uh, Quadros, even at his best, uh, um, was an inconsistent guy. He would be on, he'll be off. Um, I actually thought he gave a uh, um, um, Rome, I think he did fight Roman, gave him a good go the first when they fought, but you know, he's hot, he's always run hot and cold. And again, I think he's older. Um, I believe the rumors about him making weight. Uh, I'll go to everybody else here. Uh, uh, uh these two fights, as well as this Julio Cesar Martinez fights, what's your thoughts? Uh, you know, the the Carlos Quadras because they're actually in a Roman Gonzalez fight. Uh, I felt you could have made a case that maybe that fight should have either been a draw or he won that fight. But that was the fight that kind of took the air out of the balloon for him. Then he goes in there against Estrada. And I think what happened was the Gonzalez fight, a lot of people didn't realize how he fought. So he tried to be more of a bite down, you know, flat footed, stationary type of fighter. And then the Estrada fight that backfired against him. And same thing with the Mikoya Royu. So he, he's a fighter now that's kind of stuck between what identity he want to go with and he doesn't know what you want to go with and his confidence is shot like here's a dude who was a a, a long time reigning champion whose confidence is now shot now so i don't uh i mean yeah he had a couple wins over a couple of you know you, you know who you know who gives a shit but um yeah i i i think that the losses to those big guys it, it's kind of like a uh, uh, a Ricky Haddon effect, right? When you lose to Floyd, then you lose to Manny Pacquiao. So when you lose to big name dudes that you felt you should have win, it it does something to your psyche. And then he goes off and he loses to McWilliam Arroyo. So uh, I don't see him uh, uh, being doing anything different. Juan Francisco Estrada has hit his drive. Like I wouldn't want to meet Juan Francisco Estrada right now. He's hit his freaking drive. So yeah, uh, I'm I don't have any confidence in that fight. Uh, Roman Gonzalez and the Israel. Gonzalez fight. I'm intrigued in that fight because I am one that thought he did be Calify, to be honest with you. And I think, as a matter of fact, I think that's the fight when uh, I think, you know, they realize, okay, we got to get Calify in there in a big money fight because he's about to take an ass whooping. And they did. That's shortly after. I think he had some subpar fight. They put him in there, Roman Gonzalez. And, you know, we, we haven't, you know, we, we haven't heard from him since. Uh, but I like Israel uh, Gonzalez because he, He's tall, he's long, he has the ability to box, and he comes in with that that championship experience, which is what Roman Gonzalez is going to need if he's looking to fight um, if he's looking to fight uh, Juan Francisco Estrada after this fight. He's going to need somebody that's going to keep him sharp. He's going to need somebody that's going to remind him because uh, Roman Gonzalez, although he did beat Cal Yafai, I mean, if you want to say that's a major feat, uh, although he did beat Cal Yafai, 
understand that, you know, Roman Gonzalez, after being knocked out twice by Wayne Ham in the oath, and many thought this guy wouldn't be the same. So uh, if he wants to get back to being that monster he was, which it seems like that's what he's doing, he, he, I like this fight with Israel Gonzalez because if, if he can stop Israel Gonzalez, if he can hurt Israel Gonzalez, that's the Roman Gonzalez I want to see in there with one Francisco Estrada. Like, I want to see that dog, that guy from 2012. I want to see that guy in there with Juan Francisco Estrada. So I'm I'm heavily invested in that fight, that the, the two Gonzalez's fight. Sorry, I was on mute. I'm watching, uh, uh, doing some quick study of of Calleros, uh, watching some fights as uh, we're doing this live. Oh, he's stuff. garbage. I, he's garbage, bro. Don't even. Yeah, it'll be. Get, it'll, I, the, I watched him get pistol. I watched him get pistol years ago against Yamanaka. He's garbage. At 105, he got wrecked. Yeah, it'll be it'll be entertaining while it lasts. But this guy, his, his punches are wide. He's not slow, and and as we know. Uh, with Martinez, he's a little Brahma bull. He's a Brahma bull in there with a mean streak like nobody's business. Uh, um, yeah, nothing against Calleros, but um, based on what film study I'm doing right now, um, the champ, uh, he's going to punish this guy. Um, plus, I don't see the power um, from Calleros to hurt Martinez, and you need to have power in there to get his respect or he'll run you over. Um, so I'm just based on the observation I'm watching now, Martinez is going to – he's not only going to win. There's a good chance he's going to stop this guy. Uh, I'll, I'll go to you, Daniel. Uh, your thoughts on this uh, triple header that's going to happen uh, uh, Friday, I believe it is. On, on It's going to be aired live on zone in Mexico City. Well, this is going to be fun because <laughs> this is leading up. To the rematch we've been waiting what how many years almost a decade now you see but ho hopefully quadras doesn't do quadras things and just mimic uh, one of the people that he has been a looking like of and just fucking things up but my apologies but the, to me like i said that the quadras fights going to be interesting to me just simply because Gallo knows what's at stake. Gallo knows he remembers that fight with Chocolatito. He remembers that many people, including myself, thought he won that fight. So this is a way to make sure the insurance card that he gets it back. Now, I completely agree when it comes to the Chocolatito fight. We all knew that Gallo fight was always going to be the weak link in that division. We all knew it. And luckily, it showed itself against a good fighter. So this is lined up perfectly. Hopefully, nothing gets nothing really happens gets screwed up. Because if you get in a situation where if Quadras can make the fight and you just throw Chocolatito in there against the Strada, no. If that's the only option, no. Just to cancel the whole thing and then delay it. Give that fight the build it deserves. Apparently, what, the, oh, we're, we're gonna we were gonna do this fight anyway, yeah. so we might as well give it to you now. And now, apparently, also with Quadras, there's an issue of a bad COVID test, but he has since had a clear COVID test, so there yeah, he's still teetering on the brink. There, you know, oh, this boy. this almost feels like Quadras don't want to fight. I know, I, mean, that's, I know, that's it, the scary it, part. It's it's the scary part. Scary yeah, part. Yeah. Of course not, man. Yeah. Good shot. Dude's yeah. shot and he knows he's shot. Yeah, he's yeah, he's yeah, he's shot Warren. Yeah, he's taken a lot of heat too, um, from some internet. Yeah, he's he's pretty he's pretty yeah, he's they're really better. letting him have it. So <laughs> I will be interesting to see 72 hours from now whether he really steps in the ring or not. One last one last thing. I'm going to you on this one, McGregor, uh specifically last yeah. time you was on. But that's what I mean. Like if, if he does wind up screwing things up. Um, last time you was on on the show, uh, uh, McGregor, we were the one of the questions I asked you was about um, a car pe uh, featuring um, Liam Williams, and you said a fighter uh, that we should pay attention to on that card is yeah. um, Dennis McCann. Um, I wrote yeah. about him for Three Kings um, in terms of in terms of a prospect to watch segment. 
Uh, you can check that out on threekingsboxing.com. Um, he fought on that card. I think he fought a guy by the name of Fado. Um, I'm pretty sure you saw you saw him fight. Uh, analysis of uh, how he looked. Because I think um, I've seen him now, and I think highly of him, and I know you think highly of, highly of him as well. I, I think really highly of him. Um, he, he he's a really he's a really good kid, but um, he didn't fight on the card because he was withdrawn because his opponent didn't show up, so he didn't get to have his fight on the card. Unfortunately, oh, which wow. was very disappointing. Yeah, he so he didn't have his fight. His last fight was still in August against Brett Fido, I think. So okay, but the, he's huge. He's huge. Like when you have a kid, he, like I seen some publications list them at five eight. I've I've been beside him. I'm a tall guy. He's five foot ten. I bant the way, man. He's five foot ten. He's huge. Okay, so I, I thought he did. So apparently his opponent his opponent pulled pulled out. Yeah, it, um, his opponent his opponent said that he was uh, in the country, um, three weeks before the fight, and then two days before the fight, he said, "Yeah, I'm actually not here." I couldn't get here. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. whoops. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what happened. That kind of tells, disappointing. That tells me he actually saw who he was fighting and said, That dude's not 5'8. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> no, nah, because if you look at some publications, they have him at 5'6, some 5'7, some 5'8. He took one look at him in the. He took one look at this kid's highlights and said, I'm out. He, fight, he fights like Nassim Hamed, man. But the difference is, like, he's just huge. He's massive. He makes like man, he'd make Marquez look small and he's a bantamweight. Hmm. Mm. Well, one more fighter I can throw in the mix, and I'll go to you on this one, Gail. Um, Alexander Zayas, a guy who I interviewed um, here on Pound for Pound Box Report, as well as on 3kingsboxing.com. You can check that out, interview out full um, on 3kingsboxing.com as well on Pound for Pound Box Report on the YouTube page. Um Zayas. 18 year old prospect uh, from uh, Puerto Rico. He currently resides in Florida. Uh, fought a guy by the name of Curtis. I know he's young, Gail. He stopped Curtis by one round. I know we talk about boot centers. I know we talk about Ortiz uh, uh, um, in terms of welterweights out there. There's another one. Who's the guy, Bo, who fights for Golden Boy? Uh, the welterweight. Where's Ortiz. Ortiz. Um, not uh, the other one. Rashidi Ellis. Rashidi Ellis. Yeah, him too. Well, Zayas is the youngest of the group, but I think you give him a few years uh, uh, to get some fights and get some experience, just based on style alone, Gail. He, the kid has potential. He has real potential. Oh, yeah. He has real talent. Your thoughts? Absolutely, he does. Um, he's a good-looking prospect. He fights smart. He gets down to business. He doesn't flail. Uh, he's a super interview, as you know, and that makes a difference. Um, he's now six and zero. Um, yeah, he of the youngest, youngest pool of talent at top rank. Um, he is very high quality. He's a high quality guy. He's getting good treatment. He's fighting out of Centeno's gym, um, and he's one to watch. Also on that card, also a new signee with top rank. Also a would-be Olympian who didn't make it because of Tokyo Games being pushed back. He decided, you know, I'm not waiting another year. Um, another kid out of Florida, they're, they're picking him up right and left. He also made his professional debut on that undercard, Aaron Alponte. Uh, his um, father is his trainer. His father is um, going to, I know his mother is from Argentina and his father is from Puerto Rico. Um, he is a junior welterweight. He is a six foot tall junior welterweight. <laughs> um, and not a skinny kid at junior welterweight at six feet, which is sort of hard to picture until you see him. Uh, he scored a first round knockout. He said in an interview I did with him a few days before the fight, that was what he intended. They all want that flashy first knockout. Well, he did get it. Uh, Zayas's opponent um, was a pretty sturdy guy, literally twice his age, literally old enough to be his father. Zayas is 18. His opponent was 36. And he just, he just blasted right through him. I hope that seeing this top ranks matchmakers will put Zayas in with some 
as we've been talking earlier in the show, he needs to be in front of somebody more durable to make him work for it and make him go down to a few decisions. Just you get to the point where you've gotten in the position that Edgar Berlanga is where now the hype about him has grown and this knockout streak is such a big damn deal. That's a necessary pressure on a prospect at that stage of their career. I mean, they just don't need to be shouldering that. They need to be in there working and learning. They don't need to have those experiences when they get further in their career and the stakes are so high for a loss. So I'd like to see them put Zayas, uh, Xander Zayas up against somebody a little more durable. What I do like is that he's staying busy. They're on these you know, little cards out of Florida for Telemundo. That's exactly what they should be doing right now at this stage of their career. And by right. the way, the last few Fridays in a row, uh, Telemundo's had these little four or five fight cards with lots and lots of prospects and lots of kids making professional debuts. And they're a lot of fun to watch. You know, you could do a lot worse on a Friday night. I highly recommend them. You don't even need to know who's fighting. You're going to see a lot of people, you, you know, literally stepping in the ring for the first time. It's a fun thing to watch. Uh, one last fight to uh, kind of preview before we start to shut things down. Um, Sergey Lipin is fighting late substitute Costio Clayton. Um, for an interim belt at 140 pounds. It's gonna be on the 24th um, at Uncasville, Connecticut on Showtime. Um, quickly to anybody who wants to talk about this, your thoughts on this bout? Um, a simple run out. I think he's gonna win quite comfortably, probably stop him late. I'm disappointed in Abdul Kakarov for not getting his visa. He knew about that stuff four months in advance, three months in advance, two months in advance. He didn't want the fight. I'm disappointed in him. He, he's, he's a solid fighter. I was looking forward to that fight. One of the fights coming off of lockdown that I was really intrigued in. And yeah, I'm just more upset about the fight I'm not getting instead of the fight I'm having. So I apologize for sounding so disgruntled. But one thing I do want to say is, right? People need to can it with the whole Lipinets is at welterweight is a completely different guy and he's going to be able to knock out the top guys in the division. I keep hearing this all over YouTube, man. It's annoying me. The idea that he'll just knock out Errol Spence or Terrence Crawford based off of nothing. And I Wait, lost what? Him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm actually seeing people running with this narrative now that Lipinets, he's more filled out at the weight and he's had more time to improve. He'll just beat Errol Spence. Like, that's ridiculous. And Crawford, by the way. And Crawford, both of them. Wait, wait, wait. Well, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't he fight at welterweight when Mikey scored him? No, that was, was that 140. 140. That was 140. That was for the 140 pound title. Because we cannot that was be talking title. about the same human being. Ah, my. Oh, my God. I, I, I damn yeah, dude, who got schooled at 140. One weight division doesn't win, comes into the other. Yeah, guy who got schooled at 140 versus Mikey Garcia going to go to 147 and just beat Al Spence. That makes sense. That follows all natural logic. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is okay. I, I didn't say this in a Lomachenko fight, but, but there's plateaus that people reach. When it comes to fighters, the good things that you are able to get a, able to do well in one weight division won't transfer to another weight division. We just saw that on Saturday night against a credible opponent, a young opponent. When it came to Loma, we saw that at one fifteen with Chocolatito against Rumbasai. You cannot think that okay, hey, he's a, a solid fighter, just packed with a punch of one forty to think he can go up against Walter Waits, especially against people who are more natural welterweights. Spence, at the end of his career, if everything goes well, he'll probably be a middleweight. Bud will probably stop at 154. People, come on. Yeah, that, that rationale doesn't make a damn bit of sense. Um, do you want to, Michael, do you want to know what I heard the main argument be? He retired Lamont Peterson and Spence didn't. Oh, That's hell. the main argument. That's the main argument. Oh, hell. 
That, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to leave that at that and let them cook because that don't Lamont, make no, not Lamont a, Peterson yeah. hasn't been the same since Lucas Matisse ate took at lunch. <laughs> just, yeah. You just, uh, we're going to shut the Talk show on that the ridiculous. Lamont Peterson hasn't been the same in the last eight years. Yeah, we're going to shut the show down on that ridiculous theory that they talk about in terms of living that's going to knock these dudes out of 147 because, nah, son. Nah, bro. Just nah. Um, Gail uh, from Community Digital News, she had to uh, step out. Uh, for those who want to talk uh, boxing, want to talk media because she does teach media on the side. Uh, for those who want to talk Dancing with the Stars or want to check her out on TMZ because she's pretty much a semi-regular on TMZ right now. Um, you can check her out on um Writing boxing, writing about boxing on communities, digital news. That's com, digi news, c o m m d i g i news dot com. Um, you can also check her out on Twitter at pr pro san diego. I'm going to go around the rest of the panel here. Um, starting with you, Bo, my um brethren over at Three Kings Boxing. As, as I said before, one of them, H N I C's, um, head of media relations for Three Kings Boxing dot com. Uh, for the folks who want to talk the sweet science or anything else. Uh, um, let the folks know where they can find you and um, give you promote. Uh, you do have you are in app development um, game. Um, so talk about the couple of apps that you got out right now. Are you there, Bo? I think we uh, might have he, put Bo in oh, depression. Yeah. No, I'm so sorry, but I got a. I got a call. Ask me that again, Mike. I'm sorry. Uh, for those who want to, um, I'll just go again. Um, Bo, my brother, and over at 3kingsboxing.com, one of the HNICs over at 3 Kings Boxing, um, head of media relations. Uh, for those who want to talk the sweet science or anything else, um, let the folks know where they can find you. And, and you also in you also an app, in the app game, an app developer. Uh, uh, give you the opportunity to talk about a couple of apps that you got out right now. Uh, yeah, of course, Three Kings Boxing. Anything Three Kings Boxing, you can find me at. Uh, you can also uh, catch uh, some some other stuff when I talk about all kind of other sports uh, over at Truth and Facts. Uh, Truth and Facts about uh, Truth and Facts about sports. I changed from boxing to sports, and the app thing. You know, twenty twenty kind of slowed that down, but still we have a uh, child, child games out there. You know, like uh, uh, Zombie Hunter and games like that. We have some of those games out there, so. As always, man, I'm just glad to be here. I always be here to talk to all of you guys. Uh, you know, I, I welcome the, the, the uh, Mark to the show, and just you know, and um, I look forward to getting on here more and talking boxing. And um, I also, one final note: uh, Bo does do beats on the side. Uh, you've heard a couple of um, his beats uh, uh, displayed here on Pound for Pound Box Report. Uh, for those who are interested in um, some beats, some intro beats, or some closing music for a podcast, um, reach out to them. Let them folks know where they can uh, check you out on Twitter in case they're interested. Yeah, that's right. And uh, we just had an interview with uh, WBC champion Chantel Cameron. Definitely check that out. And indeed, indeed, you can find that on Three Kings Boxing as well. I'll go to you, Daniel. Uh, for those who want to talk uh, the sweet science, for those who want to talk uh, NBA, especially as it pertains to the Miami Heat, um, let the folks know where they can hit you up. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Rockers99, R-A-W-K-U-Z-99. And, yeah, you can definitely catch talking a lot of things. In fact, I'm actually going to talk about starting the speech body thing because I lost my email. <laughs> but I was trying to get to start this week. This is about to be close oh. to Thanksgiving, so you got to start getting pre-Thanksgiving shape. Oh, cool, cool. Just hit me up on Twitter in case you need me to send you the link to the uh, uh, invite for the group challenge. Um, I'll go to you, uh, uh, Unrivaled. The reasons you hear me call him McGregor because um, I'm, I've been talking boxing with uh, 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 McGregor for years now, uh, uh, whether it's via um, EJ Boxing Live's platform or, or, or Boxing Beats and Rhymes back in the day. So we've known each other for a while. Uh, so for Unrivaled Boxing, Mark, a.k.a. McGregor, and I've known him as McGregor um, in early days, three, four years ago now, uh, for those who want to talk to Sweet Science or anything else, let the folks know where they can hit you up. Yeah, they can hit me up on my I have a YouTube channel on Rival Boxing Talk and News. I've also got a Twitter page at MC Boxing Stars, so at M C B O X I N G S T A R S. 
Um, I post re regular articles up there that you can find, other things, historical topics, uh, breakdown statistical analysis and everything that you might need. Yeah, and viral. he's basically a, a, a walking boxing um, librarian. There are few, uh, whether it's within this YouTube boxing community or boxing podcast media um, space, there are, few who, there are few folks out there who know more than him. And I ain't talking just com uh, contemporary fighters as well. Um, he can talk old school boxing and old school fighters with the best of them. Um, so you want to really check out his uh, uh, page and, uh, and, and check him out on Twitter as well. For those who want to talk boxing, um, music, uh, fitness, you know what it is on Twitter, Brother JR at Brother JR76, as I said at the beginning of the show. Um, for all information where you can follow pop, Pound for Pound Box Report all over the blog page is a place to go to for now, p4pboxreport.wordpress.com, where uh, you can find uh, where you can um, find us all over social media, Twitter, Facebook, and all over there, where you can check out the podcast on the all RSS feed distributed uh, platforms on places like Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spreaker, or anything else in between, Mixcloud, you know the deal. Uh, where you can donate, let donation be the best nation. Uh, we got a cash me and PayPal donation links as well as you can check out my um, online coaching page. Um, let's get together. Uh, 10 rounds challenge starting November the 2nd. Uh, Gail is going to take part. I believe Daniel is going to take part as well. Um, on the next episode, we will do a recap of that triple header in Mexico City with Roman Gonzalez fighting Israel Gonzalez. Um, Gallo Estrada fighting Quadras in the rematch. Um, Julio Cesar Martinez defending his flyweight title against Callero, and as well as the um, Uncasville card on the 24th with Lippinets and um, Clayton, where we recap in those fights. And Halloween weekend, um, a lot of fights, a lot of fights. Um, Jaime Mangia uh, fighting Tariano Johnson on the 30th. That's going to be on the on the zone on the undercard of the aforementioned Rashidi Ellis, Ellis, who does not get the recognition and the attention that he deserves. Uh, rising welterweight prospect slash contender. He's going to fight on the undercard of that. And then on oh, Halloween night, man, the, man, the boxing card is full. You got Inouye, um coming to Las Vegas to fight Jason Maloney. Um, on the undercard of that, Michaela Mayer gets her long away a title shot. She's going to fight Bronica, uh for the WBO title at 130 pounds. Um, also on the 31st in San Antonio, Javante Davis is fighting um, Leo Santa Cruz in a fight at 130 pounds on the undercard of that. Um, Mario Barrios fighting Ryan Carl. Um, uh, Rugaru is going to fight on the undercard as well. And over in the United Kingdom on the zone, um, Alexander Usek is going to fight Derek Jasora. Um, Lee Selby is going to fight Cambosas for uh, an eliminator, IBF elim eliminator at 130 five pounds. So yeah, the 30th and the 31st is going to be chock full of, of bouts. And um, we may, we may preview uh, Hiroto Koiguchi. He's going to defend his WBA junior flyweight title. Um, we may get into that as well. So next week is going to be a loaded down um, episode for sure. I want to thank, I want to thank um, Lance Mayer. I want to thank, thank uh, Fabrizio um, I want to thank Intangible Boxing News for joining us in the live YouTube chat. Uh, make sure you hit that like button. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Um, also, subscribe to us on iTunes and Spotify and leave a review on, on iTunes. Just for those who don't know, on iTunes, there's two pound for pound box reports, the old show and the new show. The new show is featuring the new black, red, and gold logo uh, with the anchor um, marking um, at, the, at the right hand corner. Um, please check out that pound for pound box report and please make sure to leave a review five star review we'll get right on the show so once again i want to thank everybody for joining us thank everybody in the chat for gail from communities digital news uh, my brother Bo from three kings boxing daniel from the inscriber um, unrivaled um i am your host um uh, michael this has been episode 303 of the pound for pound box report everyone have a good evening good night